Hello, hello, and welcome back to the show. So today we're having a Synapse session, and it's been a little while since we have had a little bit of a dig into the world of Synapse, but there's been some improvements over the past quite a few months, um, building up some of the usability features in the Synapse Spark pools. So I want to take a look at the notebook experience, what it looks like today, with a few things around the variable browser, which is really cool just to see the current state of all variables I've got instantiated in my notebook, which makes so much sense, and I wish other providers would do it. Uh, we're going to look at MS Spark Utils, which may look very familiar if you've ever used other providers in Azure. And we'll also have a look at the outline view, which is really useful if you've got longer notebooks with lots of different notes and you're going to hop around all over the place. So a few different tweaks and improvements to make the usability of Spark Notebooks in Synapse just that little bit better. Now, you might also notice that we do now have music, audio tracks in the background. Do get in touch and let us know if that is at all intrusive, if it's getting in the way, if it makes it harder to understand. We do want to make sure that this is still completely accessible. So let us know if having the music in the background just doesn't really do it for you. Um, otherwise, welcome. If you're new here, don't forget to like and subscribe and let us know down in the comments if you like any of the features, if there's other things you'd like to see. What would you want to see in a Spark IDE? Regardless of where it is, what are the things, the killer features that you'd want to see? And we can feed it back and, you know, we might start to see them in various different places. So let us know. Right, let's go and have a look. So I got a Spark notebook here. I'm in Synapse. I'm kind of hooked up to a Vantic Spark, um, Spark pool. And I've already created my session because you don't want to sit here waiting for me to uh, wait for a session to start. So you can see I've got a variable at the top. I'm just saying, well, this is my path. I want path to be uh, a place in my local lake, so the lake that's kind of um, associated with Synapse. And it's going to be base park A adventure works. I'm just kind of giving it a folder structure. And I've stored that as my path variable. Now, normally if I'm like, oh, what did I set path as again? I need to just print out path or I can do, you know, kind of do a print. And, you know, I various things. I'm going to run some code to be able to inspect a variable. So this new thing, this variables box, I can now go, what are my variables? And then I just get a list of all my current active variables and I can see the path is a string. I can see how long it is. And I can see what its current output is. And it's just so easy. It just makes sense. You see it in so many normal local development environments, but you rarely ever see it in a cloud dev environment. So very happy, makes a lot of sense. Love it, good. So that is, that is really, really good. And the outline view, you might see that I've got um, various bits of markdown in my notebook. So I'm breaking it up. I'm adding in some markdown cells and giving them some headers, titles in there, essentially. Now the outline is going to just essentially break down any markdown and just give me a bit of an idea about what is going on in my notebook. So I can step around it. Same as a Word doc, right? It is my kind of outline view. So I can step in and start to explore different bits of what's going on inside this notebook. Super, super useful for navigating a large notebook. And again, I can have a play around purely based on the number of hashes. That's just normal markdown for the level of head you want it to be. So this one, I've only got two hashes currently. Uh, this one, I've got three hashes, which means it's a child subset. And to actually know that's at the same level, it's going to interactively date. I can put it at the top level. So you can have a play around it. And essentially, just whatever you're writing in your markdown, it's going to update as just your outline view. Now, for this kind of thing, it's not a huge note, but it doesn't make a huge bit of difference. But if you've got a really, really long, very codey thing, it's quite nice to be able to navigate. And especially if you're coming from a data exploration, data science-y kind of route, when you'd, your notebooks can almost, almost look like scientific papers. You'd have, you know, this is my hypothesis. We've done this. This is my interpretation. Here's some code and some visualizations. Here's another bit of interpretation. This is what we tried next. And you tell a story and you explain things in, in your markdown. And then you've got some live code. And so you've got a, a paper that's runnable. Now that kind of outline view, being able to skip back and forwards and explore it is incredibly useful for that kind of thing. So really good. Makes a lot of sense. Now, if you go into um, Synapse and you don't see those two, uh, it's probably because there's feature toggle. So you've got preview features. Um, so if you're not seeing variables, you're not seeing outline, you need to toggle that. Word of warning, that will refresh your browser. So you will have to wait for your session to start again because a refresh disassociates you from your active session. The same as opening another notebook. And it, it shouldn't still. <laughs> um, but you can use that and you can go and have a look. So. Two really quick, really small new features that just make life a little bit easier. Okay, so let's step onto the MS Spark Utils. 
Um, so there is a big old doc which goes through what all these different utils are, what they look like, how you use them. If you are coming from a Daily Bricks environment, this will be so familiar. This is essentially DB utils implemented into Synapse Spark Pools. So you can see you've got notebook utilities, got file utilities, all the normal things like redirect, move things around, create new files, all that kind of stuff. Credentials, I want to get something from C uh, Key Vault. I want to write things into Key Vault, which is not something you see in DB utils. Um, environment variables, who's the current active user, that kind of stuff. Loads of things that we can do. Let's have a bit of a look at them. So first things first, we do have to import the MS Spark Utils library. Now that feels a little jarring because over in the Databricks uh, world, I mean, essentially I use DB Utils in every single notebook, whether it's getting some credentials from the key vault, whether it's going and kind of checking if a file already exists in the directory before I write something down. Um, it's just something that you just use it in almost every engineering task. So the fact that in every engineering task that we do in Synapse Spark Pools, we're going to have to import the MS Spark Utils library. It's a little bit annoying. Kind of one of those things that you, you could just instantiate it by default because people are going to use it a lot. But still, it's fine. Won't complain too much. Uh, we do have the MS Spark Utils in there. So the, the way we use it, we can go and have a look. Things like this. We're looking at the MS Spark Utils.fs.ls. So FS is our file system ones and LS is kind of a list structure. So I'm saying, well, I've got this folder structure. What's inside there? I can just get this output saying inside my sales LT folder, I've got address, customer, customer address, product. Essentially, it's a directory browser. So I can programmatically explore what's inside various uh, different things. And that's, it's okay when you're stepping around and you're kind of just trying to figure out where things are. In Synapse, we don't need that as much because obviously we've got things like, we can just go and explore the lake. We can just step in and actually get the, the nice storage explorer built into Synapse. But then this can actually be a data set. We can say, well, you know, so for my folder in this, go and do something else. You know, uh, can I just print folder? You know, so you can, you can start to build up things. You can essentially, because it's bringing back an array, you can then dig into it, you can start doing things and you can start playing around with it. So I could run a little Spark job for each thing in that folder. Uh, you know, you can you can kind of get a little bit more advanced because you can access this stuff programmatically. Um, all the utils have a little help function. So if you're not sure what something does, you can just step into help, you can go and see what's going on in there. So we can see the different things that we can do in here. Copy a file, move a file, list the structures we did, make a directory, put, super useful. If we've got like some JSON output, I've got some config, I can put that into a file, essentially write it down into a little file without spinning up the whole Spark executors. It's just basically do a small little file read. Now, head is incredibly useful if you are doing things like exploratory things. Someone said, there's a file there. Could you just try and read it? And it's like, well, what is it? Is it pipe separated? Is it CSV? Is it JSON? Is it something else? Uh, so head, essentially, if we've kind of just got a CSV in here, uh, but I'm going to show me the head of that. And it essentially reads out the first X bytes, I mean, like 10,000 characters, something like that. Um, so you can step in there and just see what's inside that file. So it's like read the file, but without starting up a whole Spark data frame and trying to force it into a structure, trying to understand the schema, all that kind of stuff. It's saying just read out the bytes, tell me what the characters are. So I could say, well, actually, well, okay, that, I mean, that looks like a comma separated file. Uh, I've got quotes, so I've got lots of uh, double quotes around. Uh, each value doesn't look like I've got anything weird. There might be some special characters. And essentially, it's that kind of initial take a peek at the file so that you know how to configure the reader. So head, super, super useful when you're just kicking off um, exploration of new files. So notebook workflows is super important if you're trying to chain things together. So we're going to do it the, the, the other way around. We start off, we've got two. We've got run and exit. Now, exit is incredible for doing stuff. So we do exit, essentially that's just, essentially just run a little message saying, I've closed the notebook and here's my upper path. So notebook exit, success. It's all you get, all you see, doesn't really do much. And you're like, okay, well, I can just print a message. But actually that sends it back to whatever called this Spark notebook. So um, the way we do it with kind of uh, the Databricks side of things is if I've got a load of data factory stuff and I'm calling a load of notebooks, then I want that to be returned. So I can pass a load of parameters into a notebook, have that do a load of work, and then send me a load of parameters saying, I read so many rows, I 
threw away so many rows because they were bad data quality. I updated so many things. Essentially, I get telemetry that I can program into my Spark jobs back to me. And I do that using the exit command. So implementing the same thing here just means it's a little bit more mature. We can have that as part of a wider ADF or uh, Synapse pipelines um, workflow. So it's going to pass us back variables, which is super useful. We'll look a little bit more um, probably next week because uh, there's some more of the batch queuing things that's gone in. So I'll look at some patterns about queuing up a lot of notebooks and passing parameters in, getting parameters back. So we'll dig into that a little bit further. Now, the other example of that is we've got notebook.run. Now that is interesting because what that does is kicks off another notebook, sure. And I can pass parameters into it. I can do a few fancy things. That'll return me an exit variable. So if I had that kind of exit success, I'd get a message back saying the notebook said success, which is good. So I can start to kind of use that. And I can pass it into a variable. I can do things with it. Um, but also really interestingly, especially kind of uh, the way Synapse Sparkles currently work, is that's going to run in the same session. It's not going to have to use up another part of my Spark pool. It's not going to have to allocate new uh, cluster, uh, new um, executors. It's not going to, I'm not going to have to wait. Essentially, I can just run that and then using my same current session, it'll run whatever's in that notebook. So if you're trying to chain together a load of work and you'd want it to run on the same executor, so you don't have any startup time in between everything, you can use notebook.run. So I've got a little uh, exit example here. So super, super basic uh, thing. So from notebook utils, import MS Spark utils, uh, and then just, this is my exit message. So that's what we want to see. We want to see, call this notebook and see, this is my exit message passed back to me. So stepping over, you can see this isn't even attached to a Spark pool. It's not started. It's just a bit of code sitting around. And we can come on over here and say, I want to run my exit example. That should go over, run that notebook, realize we've got an exit command, and then pass back that exit command to me. Now, hopefully that won't take too long because it's not actually starting a session. It's not actually doing anything. That should take a moment. We might leave that going for a sec. Um, so secrets, secrets are incredibly important. Secrets are massive for if you're trying to build something that, where you don't want to hard code your passwords. You don't want to have things like your Cosmos DB connection string. You don't want to have your database connection string. You don't want to have all of that good stuff in your code, then secrets is what we tend to use. So that is super, super important to tie together. Oh, yeah, there we go, we can see. So my MSPark utils, notebook.run, that example, this is my exit message. And when I run off, 22 seconds, I mean, a little slow for just running two lines of code, but we can you can see how we can chain together uh, notebooks using that kind of stuff. And also I can do bah, 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 bah. my return result is equal to that, run that again, that populates a variable with it. So I can get a variable by running another Spark notebook, taking the output of that, and then storing that as a variable that I can use in other places. So that becomes super, super useful for programmatically building out chains of different bits of code if you don't want to go down the Python wheel, library management kind of route. Right, so credentials. Yeah, I mean, essentially, it's just a way of querying key vault. It's a way of going and rummaging around in your giant pile of secrets to pull some stuff out. So in this case, um, I've just given it the straight name. You've got a few different uh, overrides for get secret. So you can pass it the link service name. So you can say, I've already created a link service to Key Vault. It's over there. This is, and that, that will have its own connection details into it. I can just name a Key Vault if the uh, managed identity for service, uh, for Synapse has access to that Key Vault, it can go and get access to it and get things out. I can say, what is my super secret value? I want to store that as my secret value. And then that's just a variable that I can use. I can go and pass it around to various other places. Now, little, 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 little grumble here in that that is just exposed as plain text. So I can see it clearly in my variable browser. Uh, my secret value is uh, not so secret. Now, again, the Databricks way of doing that, of, of basically doing a find and replace in any output with the word redacted, it's not particularly secure either. So neither of them are, are amazing ways of handling it. But yeah, the fact that, you know, if you are dealing with a load of secrets um, and you leave your notebook state, then someone can go and have a look at that notebook, open the, the variable browser and see in that notebook state the secret value. So be, be a little careful uh, about printing that out and how you're handling it and all of that kind of stuff, uh, especially if you're using it to do password management and bringing in credentials and all that kind of stuff. Now, in their defense, 
a lot of things we can do within the Synapse Sparkles, actually we don't need to use the direct connections for um, because we have linked services. So actually a lot of things that I would normally do from, um, from Spark in terms of connecting to a database, connecting to uh, a data lake, connecting to Cosmos DB, actually I don't need to go and get the password and build that connection string and do all that kind of stuff within my Spark notebook because a lot of those uh, connections have actually been implemented using the linked service. So it's already stored and encrypted and inaccessible. So you have to, it's the scenario of wanting to go and have to dig into a lot of that stuff is comes up less. So given that due, it's fine. But I kind of like to still see it uh, redacted, encrypted, etc. cetera. Uh, final bit, take that get username. Uh, essentially kind of just is uh, who's currently running this, who's currently kind of uh, doing that kind of stuff. So you can see it's currently me uh, doing it. So you can do the run ID, the cluster ID, all sorts of environment variables. So if you're building up a generic bit of logging telemetry and you're kind of passing it off to various different places, or even if you do it in kind of, you know, who's the user currently accessing it, which could go down different paths, loads of different use cases for doing um, essentially runtime pathways or runtime logging uh, based on some of that environment variables. So super, super useful to be able to get hold of. Really, really kind of good to see kind of some of that slightly more kind of um, dev friendly, I guess, uh, features coming into the Spark notebooks. So, they're the main bits I wanted to go through for now. There's various different bits and pieces in there. I mean, yes, I know, I just love the variable browser too much. It's, it, it just makes me happy inside. Um, and again, the outline is useful, kind of, uh, we've got things like that in Databricks. Um, so it's kind of, it's it's essentially kind of starting to get feature parity uh, with some of that kind of dev environment kind of stuff. Now, there are additional bits that we've not gone into. So there are code snippets, they've changed the batch queuing system. There's a few bits of integration with other bits and areas. But I'll go into that as a separate video and we'll have a look at some of those other improvements. There's also a lot of performance improvements that have gone in. Um, so they are still on Spark 2.4. So a lot of things like adaptive query execution, a lot of the making joins better and kind of the management of how many um, RDDs a bit of data gets broken into in the back down to the execution plan, that's still using the old school way. So there's probably kind of uh, definitely some improvements still to be seen there. Um, but in terms of the automatic caching and some of the kind of the management hype space and some kind of the, the very Microsoft-y ways of doing things, they're actually starting to see some real gains and real improvements. So it'll be interesting to see kind of like when they actually make uh, a jump onto kind of uh, the latest Spark versions, how those tie in to some of those existing um, improvements they've made. So loads of stuff coming along uh, Sound of Spark Balls, very interesting stuff. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know what you think of those various bits of improvements. Anything you like, anything you don't like, and very importantly, anything you would love to see in a Spark Env, let us know and we'll pass that back. As always, we'll see you next time. Hope you had fun. Cheers.